Some authors really know what they're doing when it comes to titling their books just right, and I want to celebrate that. Let's talk about 10 novels whose titles are just perfect. I've got three main criteria for this. First, the title is immediately intriguing. There is something in it that compels you to want to know more. You pick the book up in a library or a bookshop, you see the title and you go, what is that? What is it about? I need to know more. Second criteria is that it's something beautiful, something evocative, something that might be connected to the themes of the novel in some way. You read the title and you feel like you're reading poetry. And the third criteria is that it's something fun, something funny, something that makes you laugh. It catches your eye because it's quirky and silly or clever. Across the 10 books I've chosen, you'll find those three criteria, but I should stress here that these are all fiction. Novels, novellas, or short story collections. That said, there are a lot of really great titles in the world of nonfiction. Just looking around me, we've got I'm Glad My Mum Died by Jeanette McCurdy, one of the best titles and covers in the world of nonfiction. Elliot Page's memoir, Page Boy, and Rutger Bregman's history book, Humankind, which is about the kindness of humanity. It's a pun and I love it. But as I said, this video is about fiction, so let's start with the book that inspired the whole idea for this video, The Remains of the Day by Kazuo Ishiguro. Ishiguro is kind of known for titling his books in a really beautiful, poetic, and even thought-provoking way. Never Let Me Go and A Pale View of Hills are two wonderful examples of this. But The Remains of the Day is a particularly haunting title because it brings certain imagery to mind immediately. It makes you think of a person's twilight years. It immediately asks us to consider certain things before we've even read the book, before we maybe know anything about it. What remains of the day? What remains of your life? what remains of anything. And what does that mean? What does it have to do with the book? This title is so evocative, so gorgeous. I reread this novel just recently, and I promise by mentioning this, I am not spoiling anything, but there is a conversation that happens right at the end of the novel between two characters, and one of them talks about how the evening, for many people, is the most important, most beautiful, most opportunistic time of the day. And in that moment, all the themes, everything that's been explored in the novel, all kind of circles back around on itself and it reminds you of the title. It brings it all home in a very cohesive, tidy, and satisfying way. The Remains of the Day is such a stunning title. And as you read the book, you keep thinking about the title and what it means to our protagonist, what it means to the story, and more importantly than anything else, because it's Ishiguro, the themes. This is a novel about regret. It's a novel about tradition and time moving forward, certain people getting left behind, whether they choose to be or not. And I don't think anything could sum all of that up better than the remains of the day. Shifting into classic territory here, we have The Hobbit. The Hobbit meets that first criteria. It's difficult for us to imagine now what it must have been like when this children's book was first published, and people must have immediately wondered, what the hell is a hobbit? And as you know, if you've read the novel, that question gets answered on the first page. In a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. Not a nasty, dirty, wet hole filled with the ends of worms and an oozy smell. Not yet a dry, bare, sandy hole with nothing in it to sit down on or eat. It was a hobbit hole, and that means comfort. We're starting to get an idea of what or who a hobbit is based on that opening paragraph, but we still don't really know. Hobbit is a word that Tolkien made up. It was the beginning of his enormous mythology. Across everything that Tolkien wrote about the world of Middle-earth, he was creating a mythology of his own. He created the fantasy genre, and it all started with the word Hobbit, the title of a children's book about a small man who lives in the countryside and doesn't really like getting visitors. That is insane when you think about it. The title, mixed with this iconic cover that Tolkien himself drew, is once again evocative. There is a mystery to it. You pick this book up, and if you don't know anything about it, you're going to ask yourself, what the hell is a hobbit? I need to know. I want to know. It's a beautiful little word. It's cute. It's playful, it's charming. It's a word that's kind of nice to say. It's fun to say. It is a satisfying 
tiny little noun, Hobbit. It's lovely. And I don't think the title of this book gets enough credit, honestly. The Hobbit is a lovely title. Moving into both modern and horror territory, we have the works of Eric LaRocca. Eric is incredible at titling all of their books, all of their short stories, everything they write is titled perfectly. Every single one of these books could have been on this list. This skin was once mine. The trees grew because I bled there. You've lost a lot of blood. We can never leave this place. But instead I've chosen what is still probably Eric's most successful piece of fiction. Things have gotten worse since we last spoke. I remember seeing this book in a bookshop, not knowing anything about it. I was in the Waterstones in Cambridge. I went upstairs to the genre fiction section and this was sitting on a little round table in the middle of the room. There were a few copies, it was presented beautifully, and I was drawn to it. I felt like I was in a film. And I read the title over and over again. Things have gotten worse since we last spoke. There is so much mystery to that. So much excitement, so much eeriness. And it gets even better when you see and other misfortunes at the bottom. Eric does this a lot with their stories. I think it's brilliant, I think it's charming, I think it's playful, and it's very inspiring. I think about the stories in this book a lot, but sometimes I just find myself thinking about the title. Eric's titles are often long. They often talk directly to someone, like you've lost a lot of blood, or this skin was once mine. There are often pronouns in these stories, immediately speaking from the perspective of characters. And the title of this immediately tells you that someone is talking to someone else, and things are getting bad, and as a horror fan I had to pick this up and find out what has gotten worse, and who are the we in this story? I love this title. Now let's move back again, into roughly the same era in which The Hobbit was written. This is 1984 by George Orwell. 1984 had to be on this list purely because of how famous it is. Everyone loves this title, people talk about it a lot. It is an extraordinarily evocative title. And you may or may not know that Orwell almost titled this book the last man in Europe. And if he had done that, would it have been as iconic? A title can really do a lot for a novel, it can really project a story. It's not too hard to imagine that if this book had been titled The Last Man in Europe, it may not have found the success that it did. 1984 was originally written and published in the wake of World War II. It was released in 1949. It was inspired by so much political upheaval across the entire world, and it was looking to a dystopian future set in 1984. 35 years after the moment it was published. And I really think that that has such a daring and incredible impact on readers. This was the 1984, the future that Orwell envisioned, or at least saw as a possibility, a warning, due to the rise of fascism in so many different places. 1984 is another mystery title. If you had picked it up and read it at the time it was published, you'd immediately wonder, okay, this has to be set in the future, but why? And what? What future is Orwell writing about here? What does he envision? Science fiction was hugely popular at this time, and so this title must have grabbed people's attention. And it continues to be such an iconic title, one of the most iconic book titles in history. We all continue to love it for good reason. Jumping forward to the modern day again, we have the works of Becky Chambers, and I've selected To Be Taught If Fortunate. This is perhaps my favourite Becky Chambers book, although she is the queen of science fiction right now and everything she writes is incredible. So it would have been very easy for me to select any other Chambers book. Record of a Spaceborn Few, A Psalm for the Wild Built, all of these titles are gorgeous, they are poetic. But the one that grabbed my attention the most was To Be Taught If Fortunate. It speaks so much to the themes of this hard sci-fi novella. This is a book set in a kind of optimistic future, where socialist policies have made certain things possible, like a grassroots space agency. The book is about opportunity, about learning, about exploration and discovery, about all of the good things that humans can do with our minds. Rather than corrupting and destroying and taking advantage of people like capitalism encourages, 
We have camaraderie. We have community. And again, we have learning and discovery and invention. Positive and hopeful things to be proud of. And so much of that is wrapped up in this title, To Be Taught if fortunate. Now this title, To Be Taught If Fortunate, was actually taken from a quote. That quote is from former UN Secretary General Kurt Waldheim, and it was recorded on the Voyager Golden Record. I learned that from the final page of this book. And the sentence that this little quote comes from is this. We step out of our solar system into the universe seeking only peace and friendship to teach if we are called upon, to be taught if we are fortunate. Stunning. Another classic book title that people generally love and I am in agreement with them is Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. At this point, drawing attention to this title almost feels cliched, but it really is a perfect title. Pride and Prejudice is about the unlikely romance that blooms between two people who do not like each other. It was the original enemies to lovers story. One of them has too much pride and the other is too prejudiced. But what's fun about this is you can arguably read it either way. Which one of them is proud and which one of them has prejudice? Depending on the moment in the book that you isolate, it could be either of them. Although generally I think people agree that Mr. Darcy is too proud and Elizabeth Bennet has too much prejudice. But it really does work either way depending on the moment you choose. Pride and prejudice is alliterative, it is short and snappy and clear, and it speaks to the themes and the characters. There's not a lot more I can say. Pride and Prejudice is a perfect title. This is a pretty new novel at the time of recording, and its title is something that has stuck with me since I read it. And by the way, I loved this book. This is Patricia Wants to Cuddle by Samantha Allen. I found this title so evocative. This is a queer horror story set on an island off the coast of Washington State. It's a kind of slasher story. It is a novel about queer liberation. It's one that makes fun of heteronormativity, but none of that answers the question, who is Patricia and why does she want to cuddle? If you read the blurb, it mentions several characters and it names them and none of them are Patricia. And you don't find out until the final chapter who exactly Patricia is. I mean, you can kind of assume there is something on this island and you assume that something is Patricia, but she isn't named until the end. That's again, not a spoiler because we can assume it right from the beginning and it's in the title. But what? <laughs> Why does she want to cuddle? What does this mean? I found this so exciting and kind of frustrating. I needed to know. If you have the American copy, the cover art kind of gives too much away in my opinion. It's kind of an inversion or an homage to the King Kong iconography, I guess. I think the UK one works better. You've got some animal fur and a little bit of blood splatter on it, which only reinforces that question, who is Patricia? And why does she want to cuddle? I love this title. John Scalzi is another author who is fantastic at titling his books, but I don't think any other title of his comes close to Red Shirts. Arguably, this is a very biased kind of moment for me because if you don't know what a red shirt is, you're not gonna immediately want to pick this up. But when I first saw this in a bookshop in Glasgow, I had no idea who Scalzi was. I saw this book and I thought, oh, hello, because I'm a Trekkie. I love Star Trek so dearly. And when you see a book called Red Shirts, you get excited if you know your Star Trek. So this really is a title for people in the know. Therefore, it won't have that same impact for everyone. But this is my list, this is my video and I love this book to pieces. It remains my favorite Scalzi book. I've read three of his at this point, and I still think that this one is an absolute masterclass of science fiction. It is a very, very clever novel that really gets you thinking about storytelling tropes and narratives. It's amazing and it just has that title. Man, I, I saw it in a bookshop. I saw the red, I saw the Star Trek-esque font and I saw the title Red Shirts and I thought, whatever this is, I need it. And then as you read the blurb and you realize it's about a conspiracy theory inspired by the Red Shirts joke in Star Trek. I love conspiracy theories. I love Star Trek. I love science fiction. I knew I was gonna enjoy this and it's one of my favorite sci-fi novels now. Red Shirts is great and Scalzi couldn't have picked a better title. I love his writing. 
I love his characters and I love this book. And finally, I'm gonna cheat a little by picking up the entire stack that sits behind me whenever I film a video. These are some of the Discworld books by Terry Pratchett, and honestly, every single Discworld book is titled brilliantly. They are fun, they are funny, they are often puns. Pratchett was really, really good at naming his novels, especially within the Discworld. Actually, just notice Good Omens is at the bottom of that. I know Good Omens isn't Discworld, be quiet. But if I had to pick a favorite, favorite title from the Discworld, I'd probably pick Guards, Guards. It's quite an iconic phrase within the world of fiction in general, and it's the book that introduces the City Watch, The Guards. And it's very hard when you pick this book up or when you just see it somewhere, not to want to shout, Guards, Guards! It's fun, it's funny, and it's very much to the point. You know who you're going to meet when you start reading this book. You're gonna meet the guards, you're gonna meet the City Watch, you're gonna meet Vimes, one of the great Discworld characters, one of the great fantasy characters. You're in for a lot of excitement here. Guards, Guards is an amazing title. And I don't actually have it in this stack, but another really great one is Equal Rights, because it's a pun. It is a feminist novel about equal rights for women, but it's also about witches' rights, because it's a witch's book. It was the first witch's book, and Equal Rights, Guards, Guards, these are amazing titles. Terry Pratchett was an absolute master of the title. There you go, those were 10 books that were titled just perfectly by their authors. Let me know your favorite book titles. Let me know what I missed. And if you're a Pratchett fan, a Discworld fan, tell me your favorite Discworld book title. In fact, just tell me about your favorite Discworld book and why. I haven't read them all. Get involved. Subscribe for books.